Um, how many of you have been out of the United States of America? There was lots of hands. Some of you, maybe not by choice, have not been military. You know, you got sent. But, uh, but some of us, by choice, we have opportunities to, to travel around the world. I remember taking a, a group of kids uh, as a youth pastor. Um, that same church, we, we took a different uh, year. We took a group of kids um, out to do a mission trip in, uh, in Utah. And along the way, uh, we were passing right by the, the area of the Grand Canyon in, in northern Arizona. And so we've got to make a stop. Well, we, we've got to head down. And we, I've got to see this big hole in the ground, right? And, and sure enough, it is, if you've never been there, it, it's amazing. You, you really, pictures like, I'm sure you know, pictures just don't ever do justice to, to what you see with the human eye. Um, some years before that, as a college student, I had an opportunity to travel with our, what was back in the day, with Mobile College, now University of Mobile, but we had a, a touring choir. And for spring break, the, the choir would travel different places. Um, some years, one year went to Canada. I didn't make that trip, my, my brother did. Um, other years, they went to different places in the U.S. But one year, the year that I was able to travel with that group, we toured Germany and Austria. And, and that was so, so exciting to be on a trip like that. In fact, we would sing um, as a choir. We had all these a cappella songs that we could do. So we, no matter where we were, whether we had a piano or not, the, the beauty, the harmony of, of the God-given <laughs> instrument in the human voice, we would sing in cathedrals. And it would just resonate all the walls. And, and, and this massive room, uh, the cathedral would, would have been built for the acoustics uh, of a choir to just ring throughout the, the halls. One of the, the really amazing places that we, we were able to go, we weren't scheduled to go there to sing. It was just one of the tourist stops along the way. But we actually were able to sing in the hall of a castle. And, and as, I was, as I was thinking about the message today, this, this image just kept coming to mind. And so I had to look it up. I had to go back on, on the internet and pull up a, a picture of this. And this is Ludwig's Castle. You may have seen that. It is the castle, I, I believe, that the, uh, the Disney you know, movies are, are kind of based on. Um, the, the, the castles they built in, in Disney World, Disneyland, at least, I believe, are kind of based on that. But that that's not a painting. That is a, a true life picture because I've been there. I've been in the halls of that castle. And our, our choir just impromptu gathered in the hall and, and somebody started singing. And then the rest of us joined in. And, uh, and then the next thing we knew, there were all these tourists were just kind of circled around and gathered around, and we gave them a, a little concert right on the spot. But Ludwig's Castle, this castle um, it is in the, the southern, the, the Bavarian uh, part of Germany, uh, right on the, uh, the border of Austria. And on our tour, we were wait, making our way from Germany down to Austria. We ended up in Innsbruck. And uh, along the way, we got to stop here and, and tour that castle. And, and let me tell you, that castle, if you can see, it, it's up on top uh, of, a, of a mountain or a hill or, or uh, one of those peaks, you know, or way in the background. But you can imagine, this is like the, the peak, the top of this incredible rock. This massive rock. There were, in fact, two castles on top of this mountain uh, that, that were um, in the medieval era, and King Ludwig had those castles uh, you know, torn down, what was left of them, they were remnants, and, and on that, uh, and cleared that foundation and built uh, this, this new castle in the late 1800s. As you can imagine, in ancient times, 
the tops of hills were pretty important. The, 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 the top of a mountain was strategic. Why would kings build castles? Why would they put fortresses atop a mountain? Because they could defend it, right? Because there was security. Because there was surety. They, they could be certain that, that this is high ground and we can defend the high ground. It's much more difficult to attack going uphill than it is downhill. And, and so they built the, 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 uh, the castles, they built their fortresses atop a, a rock. And not only did they build it there for strategic reasons, but also foundational. You know, maybe outside of an earthquake, they're building on a rock. They're not building on sand. We know what happens when you build on the beaches, right? There's no hurricane that's going to come along and, and, and blow that off the rock. So strategically, it was important to have that security, to have that sense of, of safety. There's a fortress, and it's, and it's protected. But also there's, there's the foundation, and, and you're secure not only from your enemies, but, but even from the elements. You don't have to worry about, this thing's going to fall in on me. It's on a rock. And the same was true in ancient times, even in biblical times. Think back, you know, a couple of thousand years before this, in the 1890s. Now let's go back about, you know, 3,000 years before that. And King David is, is taking the throne of Israel. King Saul and, and his family and his, his line, David, uh, uh, Jonathan and, and the brothers, they, they all die in battle. And here's, here's King David. He's, he's finally going to take the throne. And he decides that he's going to have a new capital city. So what does David do? David finds a, 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 a mountaintop. Maybe not like the peaks we see here, but, but in Israel, it's not quite like that. We might call them, what they would call a mountain, we might call a, a big hill, a hilltop. But nonetheless, David scouts out and, and there's a city. He says, I'm going to take that city, and that city is going to be our capital because it's it's well defended. It's, it's on a rock. It's on top of a, a mountain. In fact, it's called Mount Zion for a reason. That's where Jerusalem is to this very day. It's on the, the, the top of the hill called Mount Zion. And so eventually, David not only built his, his city there, Jerusalem, and not only he built his his, uh, his capital and, and his own fortress and his, probably his castle, you know, didn't look anything like that. But he built his home there. And he began to think, you know, God deserves something better than this. And I want to build God a house. And we know the story. God did not allow him to do it, but he allowed him to, to draw up the blueprint. And David had it all mapped out. He, had, he knew right where the temple would be. And God gave him all the blueprints of how to build the temple that Solomon eventually comes along behind him and, and builds this, this beautiful, this immaculate uh, house of worship to God. And he, and he built it on the rock. He built it on, on top of Mount Zion there in Jerusalem. And we've talked about, for the last couple of weeks, Psalm 95. And how this psalm is, is a song of, of procession and a song of thanksgiving. Why was it a song of 
procession. Some of the psalms are psalms of procession. It's a calling out, hey, everybody, let's get together and let's go down to the house of the Lord and, and worship. And so worship would begin out in the streets as people were being called out from their homes where they were and they would make their procession down the city streets and right up to the temple. And we talked about how in, in verse 1, the O come, let us sing and let us praise. That's a calling out. Hey, everybody, let's go. Come on. And then we got down to verse 6 and we talked about the O come there. It's a different Hebrew word. And it's an O come. Now that we're here, O come on in. And let's, let's get real with God. And let's get on our face before Him. Let's worship. Now, they'd already been worshiping by singing His praise with thanksgiving in their hearts and making the, the joyful noise and all of that. But I want to I go back. I, this transition from, from thanksgiving into the, the Christmas season. A phrase in that song, you know, caught my eye. And I began to think about this. The Lord put this on my heart to just, here's a wonderful way of transitioning. Our thoughts from Thanksgiving right into the celebration. Of, of the Christmas season. And here's what we want to do. I, I want you to look back at verse 1. Verse 1, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise. And here it comes. You ready? Why do we want to sing to the Lord? Well, because he, He's telling us to. Let's come out and sing. And, and why do we make this joyful noise? Because it's directed to whom? The rock of our salvation. You get the beauty of this? This is a psalm of thanksgiving. And, and right up front, it's, it, it, it's the, the, hymn, the, the psalm writer. We don't know who. It doesn't say it's a psalm of David. Many say it will be. Many are Psalms of David. We don't know who this writer is. But whoever he was, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, is saying, let's come out from where you are and let's sing praise and, and, and shout to the Lord because He's the rock of our salvation. And if you begin to, to read throughout the Psalms, you'll find there are many references to God as our rock. In fact, if you start to, to go back and, and look at all the Old Testament, there are numerous places in, the, in, in Scripture, both Old Testament and even New Testament, we're going to look at that in a minute, that, that picture, have, have, that paint a, what we call a word picture, uh, kind of a symbolism of God as the rock. In fact, as I studied this text, the word here for rock, He's the rock of our salvation. There are some verses in the Bible which literally the, the translators take that word rock and they put God in its place. Because it's descriptive of, of who He is. So in the Hebrew you'd be reading along and you'd come to the word which is normally the word for rock. And in English, the, the, the King James especially, they would take that word rock and where normally God would be Elohim or, or El, it's just God. It, it's rock. So, as I began to look and, 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 and go back through some scripture that talks about God as rock, I was just, man, just think about this. So at the end of Deuteronomy, all right, uh, the, the, the children of Israel have passed out of, out of Egypt, passed through the Red Sea, um, gone into the wilderness, um, and then 
spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness, and now they're ready to, to go on into the, the new land, the, the promised land. And Moses, in, uh, in, in chapter 32, Moses sings a song. He, he writes the lyrics and, and, and sings this song to the people. We have time to go back and look at all of that, but I want to look at a few verses. Because the song that Moses sings begins like this. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. And let the earth hear the words of my mouth, which my, my teaching uh, drops as the rain, and my speech distills as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herbs. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, His work is perfect. For all His ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and, and upright is He. And then later on, in, in, the, uh, in the same song, uh, a, a few verses down, Moses actually kind of began to chastise the people. <coughs> You remember? They hadn't always done what is right. They haven't always followed God's plan. <coughs> Ever been there, done that? You know, I know I have. <coughs> and so, you know, God's word will chastise us. Will will point out to us the error of our ways. Why? Because God just wants to beat down on us and make us feel bad about ourselves. No, he, he wants to, to point out some, some things that are in our life that are, that are broken fellowship with Him. And He wants us to be right with Him. And so here, there's this, there's this word that, that Moses uses describing the people of Israel. And he only, in the Bible, it's only used four times in all of Scripture. And, uh, and so Moses, he chastises the people for their stubbornness. And he calls Israel by the name Jeshurun. Have you ever come across that before? Israel as Jeshurun? Well, he uses this word because it means upright ones. And it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of one of those things where he's saying, okay, you upright ones, let me tell you how you really lived. <laughs> you know, don't forget. You, 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 or you call yourselves up right, but don't forget how you've really lived. Because here, here's what he says. Um, uh, because this, uh, this upright one, Strong's Concordance uh, in my study says this about this word Jeshua. It says, it's a symbolic name for Israel describing her ideal character. What she should be. Something that she often failed to, to live up to. And as Moses continues in, in verse 15 of this song, he says, But Jeshurun grew fat and, and kicked. You, you grew fat and stout and sleek. Then he, that is Jeshurun, forsook God who made him and scoffed at who? The rock of his salvation. See, God had, had delivered them, had saved them from bondage in Egypt and given them this promised land. And yet time and again, they turned their back on God. They did their own thing. And all the while, God was saying, just turn, just repent. That's what turn means, right? And come back to me. I'll forgive your sin. I'll make things right if you'll just come to me. And so he's the, he's the rock of, of salvation. You may remember um, at the beginning of, of 1 Samuel, the story of Hannah. Hannah um, 
was in great distress when they came down to the tabernacle to, to worship. And she was in great distress because she, she had no children. And especially a, a son for, to, you know, to, to give uh, pleasure to her husband. And so there was no heir through her for her husband. And that was huge, right? That's huge in, in ancient culture, to have a male heir. And so, uh, so Hannah had no child, and, and she's just distraught over this. And she comes down to the tap, and she's praying. And, and Eli, the priest, you know, overhears her, her prayer. She's crying, she's praying, she cries, she prays. But I want to listen to this part of her prayer. This is, uh, this is 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 2, where Hannah says to God, There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. <coughs> you can hear it in her voice. God, you're my rock. I'm coming to you and I, I need you. And I need you to answer this prayer. You're the rock. You just hear it in her voice. It jumps off the page. Now, now think about this. In, in 2 Samuel, um, uh, King David, King David writes a, a song. He writes many of the psalms recorded in the book of Psalms. But here's one of the songs that's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 22. And this is a, uh, David's song of thanksgiving when he says... Uh, and, and prays and, and sings. Uh, 2 Samuel 22, 3. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. He is the rock. The, uh, the prophet. The prophets certainly had in their hearts the, the, the image of God as, as the rock that Israel should have stayed true to. Should have stayed on that firm foundation. And the prophets would preach you know, God's words of warning to stay on the rock. Don't go. Don't leave. But stay with God. Don't have other gods. Don't serve the false gods of the nations around you. There is a rock. Isaiah 44, verse 8. He says, Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and, and declared it? Are you, uh, you, you're my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. There is no rock. I know not of any. In other words, there's not another rock out there for you to go plant your life on. There's not another foundation that you can go build your, your life on. So, so why would you want to? Why do we change the things of the world? Instead of staying planted on the rock. The prophet Habakkuk. How often do you read from Habakkuk? It's kind of one of those, those little minor prophets that we don't refer to very often. But, but here's this beautiful uh, word from the prophet when he says, Are you not from everlasting? O oh Lord my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. You're, you're not going to, to wipe us out now, are you? O oh Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O oh Rock, have established them for reproof. He's talking about some of the enemies that would come and bring judgment on the people because they walked away from the rock. And of course, there are the Psalms that we've already mentioned, filled with the same symbolic language. Psalm 31, verse 3. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. Psalm 71, verse 3. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. 
You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. And there's many, many, many more in the Psalms, so we don't have time to, to read through all of those. But God is, is telling us through the word pictures of Scripture that He is mighty, that, that He is strong, He is reliable, that He is steadfast, He is true, He is a fortress. Fortresses are built on a rock. For protection. He is immovable. He is immutable. Do you know what that word means? Immovable, I think we've got a good, pretty good grasp of it. You can't move it. Immovable. But immutable, it means something can't be changed. It's, it's not going to be one, something one day and, and something else the next and, and all flaky like a lot of people are. You can't really trust because you're not sure what you're going to get today. But God's not like that. He's the rock that is immutable. He can't be changed. He is secure. And He is sure. He is God. And you can put your trust in Him. You can, you can find security in Him. He's the rock. You can rely on him. And he cannot. And he will not let you down. Sometimes things happen in lives and we wonder, God, if you just you know, have you left me alone? Have you let me down? God can't. It's not in his character to let you down. Now, he may allow events to happen in your life. And, he, and he's, he's walking with us through those things. But he'll never let you down. He is the rock. And he's the rock of our salvation. Um, as we transition into this Christmas season, I want you to get this real quick. Um, so we're going we're to wrap it up right here. Do you remember? Um, you know, as, gospel, as Matthew's gospel tells the, the Christmas story, you know, Mary is with child and she's a virgin. She's betrothed. She's engaged to Joseph. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes for about a second. Uh, how did this happen? I don't know I want to have any part of this. <clears throat> and the angel of the Lord comes and explains the situation to, to Joseph. So in Matthew chapter 1, beginning verse 18, we find these words, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be a child of the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to put her away, to, to divorce her quietly. Verse 20, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sin. Now, I want to try to bridge a little gap here. I want to help you understand something. In language, when we try to uh, interpret words and, and, and translate them into another language, sometimes pronunciations are different. Sometimes words kind of change altogether. 
And, and the same was true with names. In the Old Testament, uh, the man that we call Joshua, all right, the, the, the second uh, the, or the, the servant to, to Moses, Moses second uh, uh, second hand to, to Moses. Mary, Joshua's going to take over Israel after you know Moses is gone, right? This this Joshua. In the Hebrew language, now they, that's how we pronounce it in English, Joshua. But do you know how it's pronounced in the Hebrew language? It's Yeshua. Yeshua. When the angel appears to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, when he says, you shall give him this name as Jesus, understand, the New Testament is written in Greek. The Greek would actually have been pronounced more like Jesus. In the English, when we translate that, we call his name Jesus. So to us, Jesus, in the Greek, Jesus, in the Hebrew, Yeshua, Joshua. Do you know what that name means? It means God said. God saves. And it's the same root word we find in Psalm 95. You are the rock of my salvation. <coughs> Yesha. Salvation. Yesha. And you take that word and you make it into a name and they would name their babies Yeshua, God saves. They use that same word in Psalm 95. And here we find in the New Testament that God has sent forth His Son and is to be called what? Yeshua, God saves. We see Jesus is the rock of our salvation. It all comes back to Him. It all comes back. When Jesus came as that babe in a manger, what was lying in that little feeding trough was the rock of our salvation. Don't you see that? Isn't that a beautiful picture? I mean, we don't think about, oh, there's a rock lying there. But think about the symbolism of that. This babe in a manger that God sends to be the Savior of the world is the very rock of salvation the psalmist sang about. He is God the Son, eternal. Always has been, always will be. And He is this rock of our salvation who has come to deliver us from our sin, to save us. And I don't know what you're, you're going through in this Christmas season. But I know there's a rock. I know there's a firm foundation. And if you'll let him, and if you'll stay plugged in, if you'll stay built on that rock, if you'll let that be the foundation of, of your life, You put your faith in Christ. And you let Him be the cornerstone, as the New Testament calls Him, the chief cornerstone. Then you let Him put the pieces together. Because that's what a cornerstone is. A cornerstone is the measuring block. A cornerstone is the most important piece. Everything else has to be built off of that. And He'll do... His plans. He'll bring together the pieces of your life the way He designed it. You see the connection between Thanksgiving of the Old Testament and 
and this salvation of the New Testament. Surely we can say with the psalmist in Psalm 95, Oh, come, let us see unto the Lord and, and make joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. So give Him praise. Better yet, give Him, give him your heart. Give Him your life. Give Him everything you are. He, he loves you. He came to be the rock and to save you. I'm going to ask you to bow with me for just a moment.